a minute or so before we get started. I know we had a lot of people register for this webinar, so, um, but as we know with Zoom, everybody comes in right at 2, 2, oh, oh, one, <laughs> all of those things a few seconds afterward. So I will, it's two o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have two very interesting presentations. So welcome everyone. I'm Maria Marshall. I'm the director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. And I try to put myself, introduce myself because I think the last webinar I actually forgot to introduce who I was. I just started talking. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's it. I get so excited. So welcome to our webinar, um, how can communities address the great res resignations? I would say almost even the great retirements that are happening with uh, tons of baby boomers and work ready life skills curriculum preps applications for job openings around the country. So I think this is going to be a great combined webinar. And as you can see, it's it's an hour and 30 minutes versus an hour that we usually have. We think this is obviously very timely topic um, for um, what's going on, uh, not only in the North Central region, but across the country um, and, and, and a big deal to everyone. And so um, before I forget, we're going to Bo, if you can go to the next slide, I'll remind everybody of our next webinar. Next webinar is remaining, uh, sorry, remaining land grant fierce while accepting the land grab truth um, of our foundation. That'll be April 20th from 3 to 4.30. Again, some great speakers um, about um, how we can think about uh, the foundation of the land grants and, and thinking about things uh, moving forward. So uh, another great webinar topic. Oh, I think all our webinar topics have been great, but you know we're, we're just getting better and better, I guess I should say. Um, and with that, I'll start introducing our speakers and then I'll hand it off to Bo um, to start off his portion. So Dr. Bo Balu is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. He is the past director of the Purdue Center for Regional Development and past community development program leader and with Purdue Extension. Monica uh, Nagel, I probably, yeah, sorry, <laughs> is the Health and Human Sciences Educator in Montgomery County. She has worked with Montgomery County Probation Department, JAG, and the Mon Montgomery County Leadership Academy to teach youth and adults the necessary skills to enter the workforce. And Mitch Wagner is the 4-H Youth Development Educator in Knox County, where he also serves as the County 4-H Camp State Director. Mitch has taught the curriculum predominantly in local high schools classrooms and at the local youth detention center, where youth are able to get a jump start on their careers and both are with Purdue Extension um, as part of that. So yay, Purdue. <laughs> so um, with that, Bo, I hand it over to you. And thank you very much, Maria. And hello to all of you who are online. I know there's some names on, on our list that I know very well, so I'm glad you could join us. And uh, even though this would appear to be two different talks, I think you'll find that some of my discussion uh, will be such where it really is going to play in well into what Monica and Mitch have to say in terms of how do we prepare people for the workforce because some of the biggest challenges we're facing now are jobs that are available but not, not competent or available people who have the skills needed. So I think I think there'll be some complementarity uh, to this whole uh, set of presentations. So what I want to talk about is uh, is how can we deal with this great resignation uh, issue that we've talked about, that we've heard about so much. You know, I can't begin to capture everything that's been in the media about this thing to call the great resignation. You know, uh, something that was labeled by one of the assistant associate professors at Texas A&M, and it stuck like glue. I mean, it's just incredible how his pronouncement uh, really uh, took off and the media really captured it. These are just some of the literally the titles that have been in the media about the great, great resignation. Why are people quitting? Uh, who's driving it? What's, there's a toxic culture that's responsible for the great resignation. Uh, it's becoming not the great resignation, but the great reshuffle. And you'll see some of the things that I have to share with you that uh, seem to indicate that. It also talks about how the great resignation is really shifting power into the hands of the employee. You know, the person who's gonna be working for a company. And the question is, is this gonna end? Is 2022 gonna be the end of the great resignation? And there could be some really interesting discussion we could have on that. I would uh, urge any of you who have a question to, uh, I can't see you unfortunately, so I can have a, my eye on the screen, but maybe Monica or somebody can keep an eye on, on the chat and, and say, hey, I wanna say something. Feel free to do that. We really wanna have you, and wanna make this as interactive as possible. 
So anyway, it was all these titles that I kept reading in the media and reading articles and whatnot that gave me the thought that I want to kind of delve into this topic a little bit more to see if I can put some, make some sense of it. So the question is, what's the big deal? Well, concerns that have been really growing among uh, industries and businesses, uh, in, at least particularly in 2021, uh, with regard to the number of people who are quitting their jobs uh, it really accelerated, particularly during the summer and fall of 2021. It had been there already, but it's really grown quite a bit. As a, as a case in point, in September 2021, you may have seen this. Uh, the number of people who quit their jobs was 4.3 million in the month of September. Now, you may, if, you were, if you've been keeping track on this, you may have said, well, Bo, it was higher than that. It was 4.4 million. That's true, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics just sent a readjustment for the whole 2021, just this past week or so, earlier this, this year. And so what I've done is I've adjusted my figures to be uh, reflective of, of these new, uh, more precise numbers. The October figures uh, did go down a little bit, but they swelled again to 4.5 million by November. Both of these, the September numbers and the November numbers, were record numbers of people quitting their jobs. And the latest number that just came out yesterday, I wanted to make sure I had this as timely as possible, numbers just released by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics has 4.25 million who quit their job in January. So let me show you a graph that kind of gives you a sense of the trend taking place. As you can see, uh, in, in August of 2020, the number of people quitting was about two point, just under 3 million. It's now well over 4 million, and that has been the case uh, since, uh, since the summer, like I said, and, and getting worse during the latter, latter part of, uh, of 2021. Who's been quitting? I think if you've been reading the media, this, this is probably not going to be a surprise to you. It's people who are in the restaurants, bars, entertainment companies, hotels, retail establishments, uh, even non-durable manufacturing, particularly those that are involved in like meat processing. As you know, that's been a real big issue. Uh, child care workers, transportation, warehousing. And to some extent, up and down, there have been some increases in quit rates, particularly of late by people, people who are in the healthcare sector, and even those in the educational system who've really have been faced some, they've been on the front line of dealing with some of the issues related to the pandemic. So uh, that's, uh, so by the way, as a point, point of a contrast, you know, if you think about the pandemic having started maybe in March of 2020, the number, the number of people who quit, at least the rate of people quitting uh, in, 2000, in March of 2020 was 1.9%. That's a really kind of good reference point to think about how this has really, really changed over the last uh, year, couple of years. It is estimated that 47.4 people voluntarily quit their jobs in 2021 in the United States. So a fairly, fairly significant number. So the question is, well, what, what are, what's going on here? What's, what are some of the factors? And it's not a one size fits all. There's a number of different reasons why people have quit their jobs in 2021. It may very well continue to quit their jobs uh, in parts of 2022. So I'm gonna go through these very briefly, but I thought I could at least give you some context of what some of what's driving this. And I'm gonna start, if you look at the, my chart, Oh my God, it's really going to go from 12 o'clock noon and go around that and go around uh, in terms of clockwise. So first of all is the pandemic. Without question, when the pandemic, pandemic really hit us in March of 2020, and it's continued different variations of the pandemic, whether it be Omicron, Adult, whatever, those have really created some hardships for people who are really, really reluctant to be involved in jobs that might make, you know, make them exposed uh, to uh, COVID. Uh, they were worried about the families and whatnot and their friends, so they really, a number of people quit because of the whole overarching issue of the pandemic. Others quit because, you know, the number of job openings has grown so dramatically that people say, this is a better chance for me to really look for a better job, one that pays better benefits, maybe uh, just more accommodating in terms of my own lifestyle. Third one is this whole issue of work-life balance. Uh, COVID is really, really create a lot of stress for families, and particularly with people who have children who've been in and out of schools, who've had to deal with childcare issues, and people are getting stressed out at work because of, as people left, the demands on the job were, were shared with th those who were remaining. All in all, it's just this whole issue of work-life balance was a, was a factor that drove people to say, I, I can't do this anymore. 
Fourth one would be burnout. That's a, kind of related to some. By the way, these are not mutually exclusive. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, influence across all these things in terms of things that that uh, have a, have an impact. Job burnout in terms of just people who just could not continue to handle all the stress related to COVID. Again, those who, who were found themselves having to pick up the slack when other employees left, a lot, a lot of stress that really created some uh, people said, I just can't take it anymore. Uh, there's a, an article that appeared in the Wall Street Journal just this past December that indicated that stress and burnout represented one of the biggest challenges to employee well-being at work in the past year, with workload related pressure harming their mental health. And the other one I think that all of you can appreciate, another thing that created stress is the fact that people said it was the day, even if they, if they were working remotely, the density of the day was a key factor, like jumping from one Zoom call to another Zoom call, you know, those things that all of you can say, my God, I'm, I've had enough of all these calls, and it's really, really stressful for a lot of people. The other one now is looking for companies that embrace a culture of, of caring. Uh, what do I mean by that? Workers were leaving jobs where they felt that the organization or the company uh, failed to have a caring culture and add a, and a very positive attitude about their workers. Uh, they didn't attend to the social, physical, and emotional well-being. They, so they felt they just could not continue in that, in that work environment. Uh, those who want to continue to work, to work remotely, as you know, many of us started working remotely uh, in, in March of 2020, and some of who now said, okay, it's time to come back, I really rebelled against it. So the growing interest in remote work, or even working either full-time or on hybrid basis, basis uh, in, uh, in remote work was a real factor. And if companies were not accommodating to that, uh, individuals were willing to leave that company. Uh, some analysts have suggested that the growth of remote work represents one of the most significant shifts in American and living conditions since World War II. That's how dramatic remote work has become as part of the, the fabric of many, many jobs. Uh, early retirement. Uh, now, this may not be applicable today, but in the last couple of years, the stock market has done very well. People's housing, uh, the value of their homes have gone up. And some people who are 55 and over decide those accelerations in their, in their net worth was sufficient for them to go ahead and leave their jobs. We know the stock market hasn't done very well lately, so we may be seeing them returning. But nevertheless, we saw that the number of them felt they could retire early because they had the financial capability of doing so. And finally, starting our own business. The U.S. Census Bureau released a report just this in January that said that 5.4 new business applications were filed in 2021, and that surpassed a record of 4.4 million in 2020. What this meant is a lot of people saying pandemic really made them think about their future, and they said, I've always wanted to start my own business, and I'm going to take the opportunity now to do so. So we've seen there's a lot of acceleration of people who decide to become their own bosses. Oh, so, you have a, a question in the chat um, yeah. from Ron Wilson who says, businesses tell me government payments are a factor. To what extent is this the case? No, I don't. That's I, I don't know for sure, but I'd be uh, I, the stuff I've read and hadn't even talked about that. Uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. In fact, because I'd like to open it up now for a few minutes. Here's all the things I laid out. Does anybody want to comment about it in terms of either taking issue with these or adding something else that they would like to offer as a, as a factor? So let me, uh, Marie, if we could, I'd love to open it up for people uh, to, to share. Let, I'd love to hear what you have to say about the government payments as to whether that, that was a factor. You know, clearly a lot of them didn't. There's a lot more people who had a demand. And Maria, this is more your area than mine. There was a probably a higher demand than there was, there was resources to help small businesses. Uh, and so... I don't know if, how much of a fact that that may have had. Anybody have a thought there? Feel free to open up uh, to talk. Are there any, any of these items here that you think relate, that you know of, either your own family or your own situation, or even uh, you know, friends and, and family members? So this is Gwen from Ohio State. I think there was an economics uh, article out of uh, Ohio State that I'll see if I can find the link to it that talked about that government payment issue. And it kind of netted out that it, that wasn't really a legitimate reason for people to stay away from work is the way I took it. And then also oh, just curious yeah. on the on the early retirement. I mean, I have a sister who's 
55 and going to retire just because she's realized she saved since she was 21 and she can. And I think the pandemic uh, was the precipitation of making that decision. Well, thanks, Gwen, good to hear you. Uh, with regard to, if the questions, did the payments given to people keep them away from the workforce? At least the articles I've read have not in the, have indicated that that has not had any effect at all, or much, or much an effect in keeping people away from the, from work. Um, I'm not sure if that was the question, but if that is that the, there's not any ev clear evidence that that has that prompted any people not to go, you no, know, not to return to work or to to seek employment. Hey, Bo. This is yeah. this is Joy over in uh hey, Joy. In Fort Valley. How are you? Doing you well. Know, I I know what you guys are saying from the article, but just in conversation with folks here in my state, these, uh, what was it called? The government payments, um, the stimulus checks and all of that um, did keep a significant portion of people in my neck of the woods from returning to work because the unemployment was much higher than what they made going to, whether it's the retail, you talked about the restaurants. Um, they have never seen that kind of money. Um, so they said, it's better for me to just stay at home. Yeah. And yeah. Let, I think it was a two year, it depending on which state you were in, how long that unemployment benefit ran. But uh, in my neck of the woods, yeah, it was worth it not to return to work. Okay, thank you. I mean, you're right. Every every case is there. You have to th think of the unique situations in different parts of the country. And of course, you work uh, there in Georgia. Uh, interesting. Thank you for that comment. Does anybody else have any other comments that they'd like to offer with regard to what they see as being driving some of the uh, the quit quit rates? Well, this Eric? is Rob Russell at Mizzou. And I'll hey, just add, you the other part that you know people talk about quit rates, but we also have a competitive labor market, right? And so people right. are quitting because they can they can get higher income from other jobs that are out there. And you see that you see that working in that sort of space. And so uh, the second thing I will say, BLS has actually done research looking at quit rates amongst different populations. They did a, it's a longitudinal study, and the average for ba it's actually a baby boomer study that has been like they held I think average twelve jobs over the course of their career from. Uh, 18 until about 50 or 55 is, the, is what the study looks at there. And that, that's just on average. And so there's a, the perception that quit rates have increased doesn't necessarily actually correspond with a lot of the research out there. Uh, there's some other research from um, unemployed benefits that we have the, actually the same tenure now in, in work, looking at benefits rates as we did in 1983. And so there's a yeah. whole lot of anecdotal information talking about quit rates, but the, the, lo the longer term research looking at this is, is a little bit more questionable about how, how much it has picked up over time. Um, for things like that. Yeah, and I've seen some of those articles too, where some people think if you look longitudinally, it is a little bit higher now, but it, but it isn't a dramatic difference from the past. I think the key point we're gonna make, and I'll, I'll make this point in a minute, is that it's not that people are leaving the workforce, it's just like you indicated, they're finding better job opportunities. The market is so flooded with jobs now, that you have your the, the employees are in a pretty strong position to try to find better paying jobs. You know, so uh, any one more comment from anybody? Well, I was gonna say both there are several comments in the chat box. Uh, so it says, I think child care played a huge part. Schools were closed for a long period during NTI, then went week to week if they were open or not. People learned they could downsize and survive on one income. Karen says, it seems like people have had a hard time mentally with pandemic issues and changing jobs might be a way to escape, thinking it will be, it will be better at a new job. Mandy says, daycare costs have gone up so much that it costs more to pay for daycare than people are generating in income. Kimberly says, I was forced to quit a really good job because of having two school-aged children. I could work remotely based on my job, but my CEO said no, told me to choose between kids and job. And, and then when put yeah, the link yeah. to the unemployment um, and, article that and, you referred to. Okay, thank you. And uh, that that those are great comments because clearly this issue of uh, 
this work-life balance that gets into issues with childcare, and then having a caring culture at the job. So you've raised some points about you didn't have a caring culture at work. It says either the job or your family, and you probably you, know, you chose your family, which is probably a very smart decision. But it is that stress of how to balance those two things. Let me go ahead, and I'm going to I'm going to highlight just a couple of studies that have been done that uh, again lay out some additional information about why people were quitting their jobs. And these are the ones that Lime made. Uh, they surveyed a hundred. They surveyed a thousand major companies. These had these are companies that had five thousand five hundred people employed or, and more. So you can tell these are large large uh, corporations. And this is what they identify: Why did they quit? Burnout, lack of flexibility. That very comments that some of you made. Benefits weren't that good. And uh, and my own personal well being was not really supported. Just like we just heard in the chat about, I was told either take the, either my either job or or, or or your family. Then what? But they also looked at for those who change jobs, why? And they talked about I, I have it's given me the ability to work remotely. It provides me with better salary, better compensation. I happen to work with a company that provides better management. This more caring attitude. It allowed better work uh, life balance. And finally. I had a flexible schedule. It wasn't an eight to five, but I was allowed to create a work schedule that worked for me and my family and, and, and the job. So, so those are the kinds of things that Lime made. And those studies are available by, by uh, online. The other one was a Society for Human Resource Management. They, they looked at uh, what are U.S. workers searching for or, plan, uh, or, or, or planning to search for with regard to new job? They found a, five, a sizable segment of the workforce is planning to leave their current job, and this is what they're going to be looking for. Better pay, again, this whole work-life balance again, better benefits, and that doesn't necessarily mean it could be benefits such as help support with child care. It could be benefits with regard to helping with housing costs. I mean, there's a variety of different benefits, not the more just the traditional ones we tend to think about. These other two are, are relatively new ones that haven't always appeared. I want to have an opportunity to advance my career. If it gives me opportunities to move up the career ladder, that's great. And the other one is I just happen to be at a place where I want to change jobs. And by the way, there is some research where people who did change jobs, they followed up with them only to find out Hey, this job wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. So I'm not really, really totally happy with it. In other cases, they were really, really glad they made that change. So I want what I want to do is I really want to give you some stuff I did in Indiana, all because all those things going on in the Great Resignation. I want to say, what can I do to better delve into what's happening in Indiana and how might that help inform our state agencies who are working with workforce issues or economic development issues? And uh, and so I want to kind of share with you what I did. Um, so I did use the job opportunities and labor turnover survey, what we often call JOLTS. Many of you are very familiar with that. I can tell from those of you who are online, some of you are very, very familiar with that. It's conducted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics every month. The target is roughly 21,000 U.S. businesses of different sizes. They're all non-ag uh, companies, but they're both public and private. And they cover the whole 50 states in the District of Columbia. Now, one thing to say is that it's not always 21,000. Sometimes it will be less than that. Uh, but if you're familiar with Joe, there'll be some adjustment later on. It's usually because more companies have submitted their data. So they're able to provide a little bit more pre precise uh, estimates uh, a, a month out after the a month later from what they released the data. Uh, the national data tend to be released within the first seven to 10 days of every month. And then we have state by state data that are released around the mid to latter part of each month. So if you're interested in this, if not, if you're not familiar with it, uh, I'd urge you, I'm going to give you some things uh, at the end a couple of reports I've written. Love to have you really look at it in your own state if you if you have uh, if you're so interested. So with regard to jolts, these are three things that it looks at. It looks at job openings. It looks also, uh, and that would be how many jobs are open on the last day of, of a month, and that they plan on trying to fill that job within the next 30 days. Then they're actively trying to find somebody for those jobs. How many people were hired in that given month? Then how many people were separated from their jobs? And separations are designed, are developed, uh, uh, involve three different elements. People have been involuntarily let go. These are people who were laid off or discharged, fired. 
those who quit voluntarily. And then there's a third category called other separations. It's people who've retired, may have a disability, they can't continue to work, uh, unfortunately may have passed away, or they may be people who transferred within the same company, but to some other location. So that's considered a job separation. So I wanna kind of talk to you a little bit about uh, the Midwest. Now, I, I don't have all North Central Regional Center uh, 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 states, but I try to look at states that are contiguous to the state of Indiana. So these are job openings. And if you look at it, Michigan has for many, many months, I looked at from a couple of months back in, in, in 2020 as kind of a reference point, and then picked it up in May of 2021 and have followed it through the, the end of this, uh, the 2021. And as you can see, Michigan for many, many months has had more job openings than any of the other, uh, at least rate, job opening rate has been higher than any of the other four states. But Indiana has always been a little bit above or at the same level as the other states, but it's now higher than any of the four other states. Michigan, believe it or not, has really made some significant decline in job openings. They, they have, I don't know what they've done, but it's really uh, taken a precipitous drop. You can't see December 21 for Michigan because it's the same one as a, as a, let's see, I'm sorry, I, I got to look at this because my, uh, the picture of people on, online are, is same one as Ohio. So it's really the Ohio and, and, and Michigan uh, from November, to December are actually on the same, uh, same trend line. So, so that's one thing I, I said, okay, Indiana's got a lot of job openings. Okay, that's, that's important to know. Then I began to, now don't, please don't get overwhelmed with these numbers. That, these are the actual numbers for each of those states coupled with the quit rates, how many, what percent of that workforce actually quit in these different months. So what I want to do is I want to kind of show you, um, one second here. I'm trying to minimize the picture of everybody here. I'm having trouble changing it, Maria, for some reason. Oh, here we are. So if you look at uh, uh, Indiana, we have several, the, the amount of openings that's really grown kind of almost not necessarily a linear in, increase, but it's been pretty sizable uh, relative to what it was you know, in October, 2020, major, major uh, increase. But if you look at the rate, and that's what I want to look below, if you look at the rate, we in Indiana have had the highest number of openings nine out of these 10 months, uh, nine of these nine out of these ten uh, you know months I'm looking at in this graph, it's now in as of December the highest percent of openings of any of these other four states. Like I say, Michigan is the only one that has essentially uh, paralleled Indiana in terms of how many months their their rate was higher than the national average. But the very bottom is the national average, and once I haven't read all those that are uh, above the national average with regard to. Uh, with regard to quit rates. So you can see high, high quit rates. I apologize, these are quit rates. 3.5% uh, of them quit in December. Then I want to take a longer term trajectory. Say, so, okay, this only gives me a snapshot. I want to go back pre-pandemic and see what I can find. So I'm going to very briefly show you what I found for job openings in Indiana. And as you can see, we saw this major, major, major decline in March and April of 2020. And that's of course when we all began to major, major change because of the uh, pandemic. A lot of people, a lot of jobs simply uh, dissipated. But since January of 2021, you've seen this kind of continuous growth. And now in Indiana, we have 255,000 jobs opening open as of December of, of last year. Very, the highest of, uh, in the last two years. But then if you look at, if you look at, I apologize here because I'm having trouble with this. Well, I apologize here. I see your mouse, so. <laughs> I, can't, I can't see the thing that's not changing on me. I don't know why. There we go. Okay, here we are. So 
Okay, there's a job openings, here's a job hires. If you look at it very briefly, I'm not gonna go into detail, but just look at what happened in May of 2020. And that was like almost like a delay in hiring people when the pandemic, it didn't dissipate, but people began to return slowly to work either remotely or on uh, face-to-face. There's a major, major push in May of that year, but it's really in 2021, you've seen this decline in number of people who've been hired. Since, uh, since the mid, mid-year of 2021. So let me go back very bad. So you can see, look at these major openings and the hires are not keeping pace at all. And that's relevant to a comment that was made by one of our, our, our one of the individuals, the attendees here about this, this the, the number of jobs that are open and the fact that we can't hire enough people to fill those jobs. So I, I, I came up with this graph and this really brings to, uh, brings home what happened during the early days of, of the pandemic. The, the separations were largely due to people being laid off or fired. And you can see that in Mar- March and April of 2020. This puts a whole brand new, uh, I guess, view of what has been happening in the workforce over the court. This is Indiana now uh, since the last couple of years. So you see this big growth. And now, again, total separations have fluctuated some, but uh, quits have been the largest factor behind that. The only difference is at the very end of 2021 in December, you saw an uptick in the number of people due, uh, due to uh, people who've been laid off or discharged. My sense of this is maybe like anybody, like you know, a lot of people end up retiring at the end of the of a calendar year. We think this is really an uptick in the number of people who've actually retired. And, and, and as a consequence, the percent due to separations, due to quitting uh, is, not, is not as high. Then finally on this part, what I did is I began to look at um, what percent of the quits were, uh, of the separations were the result of people who quit their jobs. And again, we had the highest number that, that uh, in the November, almost 80% of those who quit, those who left the job did so because they quit their jobs. The latest figures in December uh, brought that down to 71%. So this may get back to a comment made by early by a person uh, on on our call here uh, in the webinar that hey this these quit rates aren't necessarily a new thing and you can see this graph tends to indicate there were months in 2020 where the quit rates were comparable like for example in August 2020 very comparable to what it was in December 2021. So what I want to do now is just kind of give you some thoughts. And they, these are more for conversation than they are for uh, being any particular. Uh, this, this is not necessarily the panacea. You know. Hey, by the way, one thing I do want to tell you when I get back, when it comes to quit rates, uh, in 2020, Indiana had about 860,000 people who quit their jobs uh, in that year. In 2021, it was 1.14 million. So about a 34 plus percent increase in quit rates in 2020, as of 2021, vis-a-vis what it was in 2020. So again, about a, over a third increase in the quit, uh, quit rates. So let me get to what, what's going on here. One of them, uh, what are the options for us is if you're a community development or if you're an economic development person, uh, there are a lot of opportunities, I think, that we and universities, either as researchers or as extension uh, professionals can really do. One is, it, it, there's no doubt that uh, that one of the key, key things is that companies are going to have to improve their worker benefits, uh, and that includes a compensation. Uh, that's one of the biggest factors that the studies have shown are reasons why people are leaving their jobs because they're looking for better jobs that provide benefit, better, uh, better benefits. The other thing is, as we work with communities, and we've done this many, many years for those of you involved in economic development, how do we help communities and regions and counties look at creating and attracting and expanding better paying jobs? Low paying jobs will get people well, may get people, but it's, it's a very, there's a lot of churning going on in the low, lower paying jobs. They tend to attract a lot of the younger people who are con- who are not going to be long-term uh, employees. They're going to continue to change, change jobs. So the question is, how do we create and expand high quality, quality jobs uh, in our community? And how do we get our economic development leaders to recognize that low paying jobs simply are not going to, uh, especially when you have that many job openings, they're, they're going to have a hard time attracting people. The issue of remote work is pretty critical right now uh, and, and having flexibility in the job. Uh, uh, 
Jobs specified as remote are attracting a larger pool of applicants now uh, than, uh, than was the case in the past. And it said by the end of 2021, the number of available permanent remote positions doubled from 9% to 18%, according to a data examined by Ladders. This is kind of an HR entity. And it could grow, it's predicted that it could grow as high as 25% in 2022. And according to FlexJobs, their membership service with a database of about 57,000 companies, 11% of these remote jobs are entry level, 60% of them are mid-level mid jobs, 20% are managerial, and 9% are senior leadership jobs. So there's a real good variation, at least a very sizable number at mid-level, which would probably pay a much better wages in some cases. And so for, we, for us as community development people, and economic development people, how do we begin to help our communities position themselves to be remote friendly? A lot of, a lot of people are leaving jobs. They're gonna work remotely. They don't wanna be living in a large city in all cases, and they are more attracted uh, to smaller communities that have a lot of different uh, uh, diver diversity of, of, of amenities. Uh, these are things we can probably look at. Can our community become a remote friendly uh, uh, site? The other one is uh, investing upskilling and career advancement options. Uh, uh, Walmart, as you probably heard, is now uh, uh, investing $1 billion in, in career planning and development for their employees, which includes paying 100% of all the college tuition and books for their associates. Now, I know Walmart's a big company, but that's the kind of competition we're going to have. How do we help people really build their skills? And if we have such a disparity between jobs available and hires, we have a number of large, you know, have a probably a sizable number of people who don't have the skills needed. And so companies are going to have to probably invest in helping people build the skills they need and have to do that more pro primarily on on the job kind of training. The other thing is that, is, is that people are looking to leave. They want to have career advancement and they don't want to stay in a job that's a dead end job. And then today, again, with the climate in which we're living in, that kind of pathway for better jobs uh, in the company that you live with, that you're part of, is really, really important. I, there's a study that uh, LimeMade has done a science of caring report that finds that employees are more committed and engaged. Uh, uh, excuse me, I'm going to go here. Are more committed and engaged. Uh, when the a company expert, uh, is uh, concerned about their well-being, when they feel they're employed in a company that embraces a caring culture. Uh, so many workers are not so much just interested in money, but they want to work in a place that provides better treatment of its employees. And then uh, biz, business startups, uh, uh, Self-employment has been on a rise in India, and, and uh, between December 2020 and 21, we had a we saw a 27 percent increase in in, uh, in business applications. Uh, article just came out in Axios that says that uh, that there were uh, 430,000 applications to start a new business in the U.S. just in January alone, in January of 2020. And again, and that given there's a lot of startups that are likely to have a difficult time surviving. And of course, this is Maria Marshall's expertise. How do we help companies survive? How can we improve the survival rate? And that is really somewhere where we, through our educational and technical assistance and our applied research uh, can really be helpful. The other one is uh, stay connected to returning retirees. As I indicated earlier, a lot of retirees, uh, those 55 and over left, may have left early thinking that they're in good financial shape because of the housing market, you know, the housing value going up because their stock markets have done well, though that hasn't been the case recently. We are seeing now evidence that retirees are beginning to return. So the question is from an economic development standpoint, how can we stay, how can companies and communities stay connected to retirees? And now with the better, higher compensation that's gonna be needed because to be competitive, some of these retirees are going to be willing to leave to, to come out of retirement and return back to work. And finally, uh, the issue of affordable child and elder care, as was indicated earlier, this has been by one of our participants. This is really a big issue for some, for many people, actually. And so how can uh, communities look at how can we expand child care and elder care and maybe even companies provide some type of incentives or or support uh, to family to, to employees who have child care and elder care expenses it could be one of the incentives that would really attract people to either remain or to come to a company that offer those kinds of benefits uh, here's a couple of reports I'm going to want to share with you it'll be on the PowerPoint uh, this is what I worked on in January I, I uh, 
prepared this article called Job, Job Openings and Labor Turnover in Indiana. And then I followed it up in February with one about uh, kind of an update, which looked at more longitudinally that the, the data I showed over the last two years as to, to, as to what may have happened. So with that said, I'm gonna be quiet. And that we and I have maybe five minutes for questions, I believe, if I if my uh, timing is correct. Yep, that's exactly right. Does anybody have any comments? Again, feel free to take issue. I'm glad to people. We want to hear different perspectives on this. There's a question in the chat from Mike that says, "Any data on which, uh, sorry, let me, any data on which of those concepts is most effective?" I think you mean some the on the concepts that you shared at the end. Not yet. <laughs> there, there are some. I mean, clearly, uh, a number of people are are leaving, have left their jobs because of compensation. There's better wages, uh, again, uh, better benefits, and also an environment they think management is really providing a more caring attitude. Those are really, really critical. Uh, so this is kind of a, a potpourri of different options. I, I would think in some cases, certain ones will be more applicable than in other cases. So it's probably not one size fits all, it'll be a, a combination of different ones of these. There's a comment by Kimberly yeah. that says, it would be incredible if companies offered relief for summer care months, school breaks, daycare for two kids during summer is 2K a month, incentives like that may help. And I would yeah. third and fourth that motion. <laughs> yeah. Know you know, yeah, you know, and we were really talking about the possibility of how can how can communities think about the, the, the provision of child and elder care as a community resource as opposed to leaving it to the, you know, just, in other words, like, it's almost like we provide incentives for companies to come into our community. Why can't we provide incentives to really create a child care and elder care support system that's available that the community supports that as, as again, as a way to help facilitate uh, uh, you know, parents being able to, to be fully engaged in the workforce. So it's really a different mindset. I'm not sure we're there yet, but it would be really nice if we could do that. Uh, by, by the way, one uh, quick comment. I, I've written a lot of things in my life, uh, but th I, if you haven't done this in your state, I would urge you to do something like this because we have got so much, as Michael Wilcox knows, uh, we've got so much attention to this whole issue, even from our workforce development, who you would think would be on top of all the jolts data, but a lot of them don't have the luxury of doing the, the deeper analysis. You know, they get the data, but they don't look at it longitudinally. And so I would, I would really urge you to, uh, if you haven't done it, produce products, something like this for your state. And you're going to, the number of, number of downloads we've gotten of our articles probably more than all my other journal articles combined, perhaps, I don't know. And Bo, there's a comment by Sean that there was a big multi-state study on why healthcare workers in Southern Great Plains changed jobs last year. Anyone familiar with that? Reasons for transition were similar to those shared here. Yeah, I, I didn't, that's a great, I'd love to have you share that study with us if you could, I'd love to read it if it's available online. Yeah, I couldn't find it again, but uh, that's why I was asking, maybe, maybe somebody else. So there's a comment about the gas prices too and um, lack of local transportation, I think is really relevant. I know in Ohio, we're seeing already push outs of information on gas voucher programs that are available through our, what's our job and family services for families you know, who are income-based. Um, and that the pushback in the community has been, why isn't this available to everybody? I mean, why do you have to be, you know, if you're going to work, you're staying, you're staying working, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just, it just fascinating. Um, and then the discussion about um, the vehicle miles traveled tax, you know, has been bantered around again, and it, you know, especially in these rural areas, what an yeah. impact that has. You know, I don't know what you think, Gwen, but I suspect that with the gas prices, this is going to make the uh, the issue of remote work even more critical. And by the way, it's not just allowing me to work remotely. When I say that there has to be a support system, the company has to provide support to people who are working remotely. 
And so I know, I don't know about you, but we've all had to bear, bear a cost to being working remotely. Had to get my own paper, had to a computer, my own uh, printer, my own lights. I'm, I'm now working at home for, for eight hours a day instead of being at the office. It's not so, there's a cost to us. And it'd be nice of countries to say, okay, if we're going to work remotely, we're also going to support you. We're going to provide some type of stipend to help you pay for that. Uh, there are different things I think that you could probably talk about. Uh, and also, we want to make sure you're not lost in the system, that you will have opportunities to be, to be, to be uh, promoted. Because if you're not in the office, sometimes people are actually finding that they're not being treated as well in terms of promotion because they, they're not there. So, so there's just a whole different culture that has to be changed with regard to, to by management. I probably said, hey, Cheryl, look, I see Cheryl there at the top. <laughs> Well, this seems like a natural transition to our next speaker. So thank you, Bo. And we might have some time at the end for kind of combined question and answer. With that, um, Monica and Mitch, I'll hand it over to you two. Thank you, Maria. Sorry, I'm trying to get my screen all situated now, but I'm sharing my screen. So hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Monica Nagel. I am the health and human science educator in Montgomery County, as Maria um, alluded to at the beginning. And Mitch, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Mitch Wagoner. I am the 4-H youth development educator for in Knox County. And so uh, I don't know how many years ago uh, it was, but we were challenged by our director and extension here at Purdue uh, to create some new programming. And so a group of about 20 educators came together realizing that uh, there was a curriculum need for work ready skills, those uh, soft skills that people need in the workplace. Uh, and so it started out as in work. Um, and so Indiana as where we are from, but we, uh, after having it for a few years and having some data behind it, we wanted to be able to sell it. So it went through a facelift this past year and is now work ready um, and available for other universities to purchase and use in their um, counties and states. And so this curriculum is 10 courses uh, that can be used as a series. You could do all 10 of them in a row, or you could pick and choose each individual one based off of the audience uh, that you're working to uh, meet. And I'm realizing that I'm on the overview page, so I should move on. Um, <laughs> and so the purpose was to teach those life skills needed to increase the number of qualified applicants for those job openings uh, that we had. And as we now see that there's even more job openings due to the pandemic that we couldn't have uh, predicted when we created this uh, curriculum. But the idea really is this is used a lot for youth in the state of Indiana, but we also wanted something for adults who had been displaced from work. And so uh, Bo shared there in some of his statistics that at the beginning of the pandemic, people were laid off as opposed to quitting. And so um, whether it was economic reasons they had to be laid off or um, their skill at the job <laughs> that they were laid off. Um, it really, this was to help them build those skills in order to be um, hireable in the future. And so, as I said, there's 10 lessons. Each lesson has a lesson plan included in it, as well as some very nice handouts. And as we go through this presentation, you'll be able to see those handouts. Uh, and we made sure for it to be as interactive as possible. So there's links to YouTube videos, there's activities that um, individuals will do in the class. So, you know, the idea was not to stand up and really just lecture to all. The suggested audience size for this is 20 participants. We found that this really allows for great conversation um, and everyone to be involved as opposed to, you know, some of those people get, being um, talked over and that sort of thing. Um, and in Indiana, we do a lot of series programs, so we really recommend that they don't attend just one session and not the next, that they come to all of them. Um, but like we said, it is, you can pick and choose, so you could take a certain lesson um, only and offer it to someone in a whole new class the next time. So here are the 10 lessons that are available and we're gonna go through each of these individually. So the first one is plan for life. And so the idea too behind this session is that if you are offering it as a series that you will start for this one uh, because in order for people to find a career or job that's gonna suit them, they really need to have a plan. Uh, and so this first lesson really helps them think about uh, what they want out of life, what kind of jobs they could be interested, and then helps them set goals to achieve those. And so we really ask that this one be done first to really help introduce the rest of the curriculum. 
And, and here's one example uh, that one of the activities that we do in the curriculum, and it's called the 100s. It's a roll of the dice game. And so you have uh, students break up into groups and they roll the dice. And if they roll a one or a six, they start running, writing numbers on their paper. And then they pass the dice to the next person or the next person aggressively steals the dice from them. And um, that person has to roll a one or a six to be able to start writing. So the idea is to get to 100 first. And so you can write until somebody rolls a one or a six. Um, and then at the end, we summarize this activity by, you know, finding out what was frustrating for the youth or adults who are participating in this. And the idea is that you don't want to leave your life up to the chance of the roll of the die. You want to have a plan set in place to make sure uh, that you're going to achieve those goals. You know, if you don't make a plan for what you're going to do after school, if you don't make a plan for how you're going to apply for jobs, uh, you're just leaving it up to chance that you'll get one. And so making sure that you have that plan in place in order to do so. And now I'm going to pass it over to Mitch. Mitch, you're muted. Sorry, I thought I clicked that, but I guess I didn't. Um, I want to answer Tiffany's question real quick in the chat. Um, so what grade, le grade level this is really is geared for is really for that um, high school level, um, freshmen, those type of um, classes. Um, you can probably scale this down to middle schoolers, um, just depending on, on the, the different activities um, for, the, for each lesson. So now is the, I'm gonna talk about the personal accountability. Um, and so this is one where um, youth are able to gain that, uh, that understanding about being accountable in a workplace. And it, we, we do a, little, a few different activities on thinking about their accountability and, and different things that they have to think about um, in a business, in a business setting, setting. And so just make sure that they understand what is accountable and what is some of the responsibilities that they have to hit. Okay. Next slide. Um, and so I always enjoy with this one conversation I had with a group that the kids in a youth detention center, the one kid says, now, if I hit Bo, but Mona gets blamed for it, me being accountable is me speaking up for it, that I did it, not somebody else. And I thought that was a real understanding, just making sure that they understood how they are accountable. Because there's a lot of different things that we talk about is making sure that we don't blame people. We make sure that we find the solution to the problem and that make sure that we do cover the things that we need to make sure we're accountable for. Okay. Mike, you have anything to add on that one? I messed that one up big time, I feel. <laughs> You're good. I was okay. going to say, this is one of my favorite lessons because uh, there is a lot of people placing blame potentially in other uh, in work environments. And so having them understand that they need to take that responsibility for any action that happens. If you're working in a restaurant and the kitchen's behind, you don't come out and you know be like, oh, our kitchen staff doesn't know what they're doing. Sorry, they've messed up your order. Uh, they need to come up with a better reason for why uh, that potential happened. Um, and so it's, it's a very challenging lesson for youth, especially, um, but makes them think outside of the box. It, thinks, it makes them think about what leadership skills look like and that sort of thing. I saw a chat come in. Oh, oh I made the chat too big now. All right. Uh, so then we move into career planning, and uh, basically this is an introduction to the world of work, and um, we make sure too to, that we're highlighting the 21st century uh, workplace proficiencies that uh, need to take place for, uh, especially, you know, when you're going into schools, trying to help them understand why you should be able to come in and teach this class. It's important that they understand the 21st century connection um, to them. But barely um, part of the resources they're getting in here is they're doing some self-assessments. So they're determining what it, it, what kind of skills it is that they have and how those apply to some sort of work. Uh, they take several of the career type assessment tools in here, and we tried to make them uh, assessment tools that would be nationwide as opposed to just specific to Indiana to really help them start determining what it is they would like um, to do as a career. So now a lot of stuff is now on social media. And so we also wanna talk about how are they digital citizenship? How, how are they being responsible on social media? Because once it gets posted, it's on there. And so we go through a couple different um, scenarios that are talking about um, making sure that they are safe, make sure that they are being smart on 
social media. Uh, we go through a couple of case studies, like talking about um, some scenarios with social media. Uh, we also talk about cyberbullying and make sure that they understand what that is and make sure they are not doing it. Uh, we also talk about proper etiquette of social media, which even some adults may need that. Um, this is a nice reminder of what is etiquette for social media and how to make sure you, as minors, how should you be using social media and also how you should not be using it. And how, yeah, that, that businesses really do look at your social media profile. Um, I heard one, one study state that a, they will read your resume in 10 seconds, but they'll spend like five minutes on your social media profile looking at pictures that you've posted. And so I think giving those kids an understanding of how important social media is, um, is I think it's very beneficial for them. Sorry, you froze on me there for a second. So I hope I'm just coming in right when you're finishing. <laughs> um, I was also going to say that, yes, discussing with them uh, how what they're posting on social media reflects their employer. And so their employer really cares about the things that they're posting out there for the world to see. Uh, teamwork is another lesson that we talk about in here. And this is one that came from uh, several employers were telling us that conflict management, problem solving, and teamwork is really the skills that uh, the workers are lacking and that they need to see uh, them have that skill coming into the workplace. You know, they're like, we can teach them whatever skill it is that they need for this specific job, but we need them to be able to have conflict management, problem solving, and teamwork skills. And uh, so we included that in here. Um, so they do another assessment tool, really thinking about their communication style and uh, whether they're going to try to, you know, be an aggressive communicator, whether they're kind of the person who, when there's conflict or anything, they take the back seat and try not to be involved. Uh, and you can see here some of the questions that they are expected to answer, whether that behavior is going to cause them to be a good team member, uh, that, what kind of communicator am I, the conflict management style and those sorts of things. So for time management, we, we have them fill out an activity of seeing how they, their, how they schedule their time, both in their personal and also in their work life, because we wanna make sure that they are scheduling their time appropriately and not make sure that, they don't, that they're not having as many time wasters, uh, making sure that they're organized, that, they're pro, that we talk about which tasks you should prioritize and also make sure that they're, they're not procrastinating. And even adults, I know I do it all the time, is I procrastinate till the last minute because I have a checklist I need to go through. And just making sure that how we work through that checklist, making sure that we prioritize our time. Um, because it is important that um, we, because businesses and also in our personal life, we have to have that time management to make sure that we do succeed and um, to get the job done. And on the screen, you also see the handouts of some tips that we try to give them of lists of time uh, wasters and some strategies for that. And this handout is a really fun, where not the specific handout necessarily, but the one that we actually asked them to track how much time they have spent on several different activities and to watch them realize how much time they've actually spent, um, essentially wasting time, because I think most of us could agree that maybe scrolling through social media isn't the best use of our time. Uh, <laughs> that they start to realize, oh, these are the types of things I'm doing. And I, I think that scrolling social media happens more at work um, than any of us probably like to admit. <laughs> uh, budgeting is another key factor. And I always like to share the story here that when I got my first big girl job, uh, that I spent my entire paycheck at the mall. Uh, didn't really think about needing to pay my bills. <laughs> and so I learned my lesson pretty quickly there. And um, so this lesson, we spend a lot of time discussing how to budget your uh, first paycheck, possibly, or many, all the paychecks after that, um, especially to if it is their first big kid job, they probably didn't have any income coming in. So that first making it to that first paycheck is very crucial. Uh, and so again, budget worksheets. So they work on actually creating their budget. We talk about how much of the budget is spent on different areas, such as housing, transportation, uh, it's interesting that there seems to be a very lack of understanding of how much money is probably spent on some of those things. Um, but with, when I worked with youth, I've also been very surprised by how involved some of those youth are in their family budgets. Um, 
and have a great understanding for these things. Um, but also talking about that rainy day fund of how when your car breaks down and you need to repair that car, you need to make sure that you have some of this money in savings. So don't go spend whatever you didn't budget at the mall like I did. Um, so this is probably one of my favorite lessons to do with the kids uh, about dressing for success. And because we always wanna make sure we explain to the kids and demonstrate the importance of that first impression making sure that you're properly groomed. What should you wear? What should you not wear? Making sure you have a positive attitude and make sure you're enthusiastic when you do that, when you walk in for to hand in your application or for that interview process. Because um, we wanna make sure that the learners look the part because when they look the part, they'll probably get the part. And so I think it's really important to understand um, that how those job interviews looking and make sure they understand the difference between business casual professional wear um what should you wear to an interview at mcdonald's or what you should not wear to an interview i think a lot of kids don't realize that and so we talk a lot about that um with the kids and talking about which outfit looks best and so we have several pictures that they'll go through and evaluate and saying okay this is a good outfit um to interview for a blue collar job or that outfit yeah, that may be good for like a fine arts museum personnel um, for that, but not really a good one for a business job. Um, and so some of the fun activities we do with them is learning how to tie a tie or a scarf. And I think this is just a fun activity we, we do with the, all the kids. And I think they really do enjoy it. Um, just learning how to tie a tie. Um, even the girls, we always tell them, your boyfriend may need to know how, you may need to know how, if you work as a waitress at the Cheesecake Factory, guess what's in your uniform? A tie. And so I think just having that basic knowledge of how to tie a tie and how to look professional for that job interview is so crucial nowadays. I'm glad to see in the chat box that I wasn't the only one who spent my entire paycheck at the mall. Makes me feel better. <laughs> and uh Kimberly, you make a good point about the credit cards, and that's actually not something we have in that lesson. Uh, so we need to make a note of that uh, for when we make some updates to include some credit card information, because that is absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so then kind of one of the few last lessons, or I guess what order you put it in, is uh, creating those resumes and cover letters. And uh, with our youth, and even a lot of those displaced workers, they do not tend to have resumes. Many of them have worked the types of jobs where maybe you just fill out an application and not worry about a resume. Uh, so this is one of the most challenging lessons uh, to work with them through in creating that resume that um, is going to get the employer's attention. So we spend a lot of time talking about how you need to make sure you have something eye-catching at the top of your resume because uh, they don't get much past the thumbs when they're holding your paper in your hand. If you haven't impressed them by the time they get to their thumbs, they're not going to read the rest. Uh, so if you didn't graduate high school, don't put that as the thing <laughs> that the potential employer is going to see that might not impress them, but instead put something that will. We talk about using power verbs uh, to start those uh, sentences in your resume uh, in order to really get your point across of what you did. Uh, you know, don't just say I was a dishwasher, make that sound much uh, more significant uh, than what it was uh, to have them do that. I find too that a lot of the people, I've worked a lot in our probation department and our jails with some of these people trying to get them hireable when they leave. And so their vocabulary level is very low. And so I have spent uh, lots of time just working on, you know, not only what those power verbs are, but just verbs in general, uh, spelling that sort of thing uh, with these um, participants. And then, the, yep, the last one is interviewing and just help, helping youth understand the interview processing, understanding the importance of the interview. I'm um, just even covering how an interview should lay out normally an interview is to make sure they understand the proper etiquette and the steps that is that goes through an interview um, with that. Um, I know I do a lot with our local FFA chapters with judging and helping with those job interviews because I think it is very crucial um, for that is to under, help them to understand those important chances of that interview. Um, I know my first interview, I walked in an Apple Auto Parts, handed in my resume, and then we stepped in the back. And so, and then also just helping them through some of the questions that they could be asked. Um, some about the jobs, make sure even some of the funny ones that they may get asked. 
um, just helping them understand and work through and being able to partner up and trying to ask each other questions so they can be able to formulate an answer. And even giving them some, I think we give them a sheet just of those calming questions. Um, I always share the one question that I did not get asked at mine was I, they wanted me to say the ABCs and count to 20 when I worked in Nap Auto Parts. They forgot to ask me that question because they do inventory. So they need, want me to be able to go find that set of brake pads on the shelf. So um, just making sure they understand the importance of those questions and also being able to, to be able to formulate a statement to be able to get their point across. And so. Mitch, one of the things uh, I know I've discussed with mine since I said I work with the probation office and I know you work with the detention center is also discussing with them how to address when an employer asks about your um, your criminal history. Uh, you don't, you know, ignore it. You help them address it. And hopefully you have learned something uh, from your mistakes in the past. And so then you express how you have learned from that. Uh, but also talking to them about being realistic about a job that they're going to apply for. So if they have been arrested for theft, applying to be a teller at a bank is probably not going to be in their best interest. So trying to set them up for success and applying for jobs that would um, apply and would probably be okay with their criminal record. Yeah, and lastly, I think the other one is the different types of interviews that we're seeing anymore. Um, now we're seeing more phone interviews, more Zoom interviews, and, and, and also we'll still have those in-persons, but I think that's one thing we may need to look more on for in, in the next update is how do, how should, what is proper etiquette for a Zoom interview? Um, and just make sure that we stay on top of that also. Okay, so throughout the lessons, we do try to make sure we do cover um, the 21st century learning skills that are taught. And so we do at every lesson, it shows which of those skills are taught throughout each lesson. Uh, so we have seen the impact as Monica made uh, comments er earlier. Um, so since this was launched in the summer of 2017, uh, we've had more than 800 youth participate in this curriculum. And so we've listed a few of the questions and some of the results that we've seen. Um, and I think the one that really jumps out to my mind is that one in the middle about youth understanding the importance of having a professional image on social media. I think that just the dramatic change between year one to year two, I think really talks volumes for the, the curriculum that has helped those youth understand that. So um, evaluation. Um, so we do have a couple of ways to evaluate it. Um, so um, I'll let Monica more handle this one because she's done this one more, way more than I have with dealing with the 18 and older adults. So we do have an evaluation for adults. Um, and basically the key to that is you'll have to reach out to me to get that evaluation tool. Uh, but basically we have a set of questions for each lesson. Um, and so you just combine each of those um, in order to do that evaluation. Uh, the data we shared there is for youth because that has been the majority of the audience reached in Indiana. So we don't have a ton of impact from our 18 and older crowd, uh, but we do have an evaluation available if you're interested in using that. So this is the one that I've used a lot, and that is for the 18 and younger. Um, so we've been using the 4-H common measures, um, the college and career readiness uh, tool. And so we, you, to implement this, you just have to use, follow your common measure IRB protocols for your universities or reach out to your 4-H educators. Um, I, uh, potentially some colleges are not associated with 4-H, um, but I will be happy to try to help work you through some of those in possibly using the adult one for those youth, for those who are not in 4-H. Um, so as we made comments earlier, uh, the curriculum really is set for those high school classes uh, or similar audience. Uh, we do try to do a minimum of six hours. Um, as Monica made comments earlier, we try to do series. And so one of the IRB pr protocols for common measures is six hours. And so we wanna make sure we're able to um, utilize that survey tool. Um, we work with a lot of school counselors to provide the workforce um, for those schools. And uh, I think it's also a very good one just to reach out to them. They are a very good resource. So uh, conducting with adults, 
Um, here's where you're able to work with more with your GEDs, um, displaced workers, and even your judicial systems, as Monica made comments earlier. Uh, all 10 lessons are applicable, um, so you're able to select the ones that are based on their needs, with the first one being the plan of life. And so um, it's encouraged, but it's not mandatory uh, to use those six hours, the six hours. So, and then the big question is, is where do you purchase it? So it is currently available um, on shop4h.org um, and the cost is $29.95 plus shipping and handling. Um, and so um, it's available for anyone to purchase right there. Mitch, and anyone, you don't have to be a 4-H educator to shop 4-H, correct? That is correct. Anybody can purchase it. And I think that is all we have for you. As I said, if you're interested in the adult evaluation, you can reach out to me and here's my email address. Um, but if you have any other questions, we'd be interested in answering those. Well, I think there's a comment in the chat, Monica and Mitch. I see it. So. Um, as far as the adult settings we have offered in the, this in, I have offered it uh, for those GED classes that Mitch mentioned, or it's now the HSE courses um, that Mitch mentioned during the uh, presentation. Uh, the judicial system has been another one, the probation department. Uh, work one is also an opportunity I know others have used. I think Tanya is on this call and I think she has used it with some adult audiences if she wants to chime in where she has used it. Yes, that's, that's correct. We've also had educators who have used it, um, like those who are using like nonprofits to help develop the career readiness skills. And so we've had other nonprofits who have partnered with us. So really anyone that is working with adults who are trying to get back into the workforce or improve the chances within the workforce um, benefit from this program. And I was going to say, as far as how we attracted attendees for my probation department program that I had done, uh, the probation officers recruited them and their main goal there was that they wanted these individuals to be off of probation and there's fees that you have to pay in order to no longer be on probation. So their whole goal was uh, to get these guys jobs uh, so that they could pay their fee and be done with probation. So they kind of had a big motivation to get this captive audience for us. Uh, do you mean work ready for the curriculum? You said work one, Amy. Work one is uh, an employer. Uh, do you want to unmute? What do you mean? <laughs> I'm sorry. I may have misunderstood. It's okay. You were talking about the curriculum used for the adult population and then she referred to work one i thought it was just the adult curriculum gotcha no the work uh work ready is for adults and youth both and so uh the main adaptation that you might need to make when using the work ready curriculum for adults is not spending as much time maybe talking about college readiness and so some of those areas maybe talk more about some cert certifications they could go back and get uh, and those type of things. But otherwise, the curriculum really does work well for both audiences. It is typically a lower literacy level of adults. It's not going to be, uh, you know, college graduates who are needing this course. It's going to be those who uh, did not finish high school and maybe finish high school, but um, need a little more assistance. Thanks. That's exactly what we're looking for. Great. Monica or Mitch, this is Tiffany Mackey. And um, how do you juggle, like, if multiple schools in your service areas want this, uh, when you're only one person or one educator? Do you, do you go in and ask for help? Are the teachers allowed to do some of the activities? How do you guys handle that? So I think the curriculum, anybody can buy the curriculum. So um, you, if you as how many classes needs to teach it, teachers want to teach it, you can easily buy that number of many of curriculums. The problem that will come down to is how you want to evaluate it. Um, for for Indiana, for myself, um, if I was going to be administering wanting to use common measures, I'd have to oversee it and work through that process to be able to use the common measures. But if you're not looking to really use a 4-H common measure type of 
survey, then you would not have to worry about that type of making sure requirements to meet. But anybody can teach the, the, the lessons anywhere from a camp counselor at a summer camp day or a day camp um, to a judicial system. Okay, and then my other question is when you do the 10 modules, let's say for a particular class at a high school, um, how, how many weeks in between the modules? I mean, is this like an all year process where you maybe do a module a month or what, what's the time frame if they so want to see all the modules? Normally what we'll do is we work with our with a local teacher at the high school. And so we give them, here are the 10 lessons, which are, we're able to come in six times, which six would be the best ones for us to cover. Um, resume writing uh, is not one we cover a lot because the kids are normally getting that already. And so we don't want to duplicate those the, that same topic. And so we're, we're able to work with that teacher to figure out which ones will best work for those kids. Okay, thank you. And I think you could uh, take as long as you would like or do them as close as possible. Uh, when I've worked with the JAG program, which is Jobs for America's graduates, uh, we go in once a month and that's a good class to work with because uh, those students have been identified as someone who has a barrier to graduating and then getting a job post-graduation. And that class is also required to have so many guest speakers. So they really want you to come in. But I know that other ones have also gone to English classes to teach this as well. Um, but I did once a month when I went to the JAG program. Any other questions? We can also open it for questions for Bo, since we have a, a few minutes as well. Please feel free to unmute yourself. We're very informal. <laughs> well, I'll just make a comment that um, when it comes to um, when we were talking about child care and how that's impacted um, the ability to get to work, get a job or the resignations. If you've looked at the household pulse that the census does now every two weeks, um, one of the major reasons for um, people leaving the workforce or reducing hours was child care or taking, taking care of a child, not having that flexibility. So I think that is a major issue that people will be working on, and particularly for women um, in terms of reduced hours, losing a job or just leaving um, their jobs. It's, it's when you look, I mean, women are basically childcare just devastated um, women during the pandemic. And so I think it's going to be slow going. So it's, um, I think it is a big issue that we'll be looking at whether it's research wise or extension wise on things on how we can um, reduce that obstacle. Well, with that, I guess we'll call it to an end. I won't say that you're going to get 15 minutes back. I've seen that that is a bad way to end meetings, as if you had wasted an hour and 15 minutes, which we know that has not been true. So feel free to um, use your 15 minutes uh, to meditate or, <laughs> or do some yoga before your next Zoom meeting. <laughs> so that seems like a more positive going forward. Um, so again, we look forward to seeing um, many of you at our next uh, webinar, which is in April. And thank you very much to our speakers. This was wonderful. Thank you.